Hello everyone. My name is uh, Mick Pletcher. This is the first time I've ever spoken here at Freak Nate. Welcome. Bravo. Welcome. 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 Figured I would uh, try to spend this time this time to spread some of my own knowledge to you all. My name is Mick Pletcher. I'm a go by Mick Meister online. I'm an SCCM administrator at Gresham Smith and Partners. I run a podcast, deploymentcast.com, that deals nothing but with deployments, SCCM, any questions you have on builds, so forth. You can listen to my podcast. I'm a blogger also, blog about the same stuff mickit.com and then I'm also an iOS developer. So today I'm going to be talking about deployments and what goes into deploying software. But the first thing we need to do is there are several layers here that we have to define in deploying software. When I first started doing SCCM administration, which I actually started out with SMS 2003, I just jumped right in. Didn't think about the project management process of it, and it got me in trouble a few times there. Mad users, mad management, and that's when I went after my project management cert and started using project management techniques, and it's really worked for me, and it's given me a relationship with the staff, with my clients, which is the employees of the company I work for, and it's give me the respect that I kind of like blown off there at first because at first I didn't really know a whole lot about what I was doing and just thought I could push software out to somebody's machine and that was it. Yeah, we were forcing to reboot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing we need to uh, look at is the steps here. There are the business owners and stakeholders, communications, which to me communications is probably the top, top thing that you need to have with the company. Uh, preparation, getting everything set up, what you need to do um, to get the package, uh, what you need to communicate, what you need to do to get the employees ready for it, uh, then your actual packaging, and then the actual deployment. The business owners, that's the person in my environment is the first person that comes to me and will say, can you push so-and-so software out? Right now I'm working on pushing Microsoft Office 2013 out. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or worse, Office 365. Actually, actually though, 2013 is going to be easier than 10 was for me. Yes. Drastically easier, actually. No, uh, no PIA and None of the B store or any of that stuff have to be pushed with this one, so I'm kind of lucky on that. So the business business owner is the first person that comes to you, the person that is actually going to give you the resources to deploy the software, that will pay for the software, pay for help if you need it, um, those such things. And there's a list that I devised that I use in my company when a business owner comes to me, and I go through this list, and it's what gives me a good relationship with him or her. And that list starts out here like with the goal. What goal is intended uh, to be accomplished by the deployment? Is it a hot fix? Is it a full deployment of software? Or is it a, just a file they need replaced? Uh, whatever. What do they want achieved by this? Um, then the audience. Who am I going to be deploying to? I mean, a lot of times that that varies. It's not always company-wide. Um, I work in architecture and engineering, so we've got different disciplines that I'll deploy different types of software to different types of engineers, for instance. Uh, business owner communication, that's a big one. What kind of communication does he or she want you to have with them? And do they just want updates? Do they want you to keep them in the loop of everything? I've got one right now that I'm doing. That, he wants a copy of every email I send out on this project that I'm pushing right now. Your start date, end date, both of those, 
definitely are valid points. Um, packaging time, I always, I give them an estimate, but when I'm doing this list with the business owner, I mean, you can't fill out everything. Yeah, I'll fill out what I can when talking to the person and then fill out what's next afterwards and then come back to that user and say, like for instance, the packaging time. If it's a new project that I've never even, that I don't know anything about at first. And then like, what are the requirements? They need to tell you <clears throat> what is required, prerequisites do users need, uh, do they need like training, do they need you know, books, other stuff like that, what needs to be in place for this. Uh, installation method, uh, what will take place on, uh, to install the software. Personally, I use PowerShell. I, I script almost all my deployments out when I'm pushing software. I used to do BB script, and I switched to PowerShell about two years ago, and I just can't get enough of it. Up. I'm a PowerShell geek now. It, it really is. It's so powerful, and I'm actually... Bash. <laughs> it's it's, it's kind of like Windows version of Bash, really. Because, I mean, they, they even ported over a lot of Linux commands. They do. I feel kind of comfortable. I'm even trying, I'm trying right now to get them upgraded to PowerShell 3. And, you know, PowerShell 4 just came out. So, hopefully we'll get 3 here soon. Uh, so, I use those. We, I still use, actually, one of the best tools I've ever used in deployment is Microsoft SMS Installer. It is it was put out with Microsoft SMS 2003, but it's still, even though it's more than 10 years old, it is a very slick program for just doing a simple script and pushing the software out. It's really easy to... And you can still download it on the um, net. It's still available out there. Uh, your deployment method, will the users be able to selectively install the software? This has been our big one right here, and that's what I'm really going to get into coming up in this speech, is the fact of how users get the software. And that is, with the mobile platforms out here now, that's been my biggest hurdle. <coughs> to effectively deploy software is because of these. Because people close their laptop lids, it doesn't shut the system down, so you never get a reboot. If it's a software that needs to be rebooted to finish up an install and so forth. So that's, in fact, we just worked through here a couple weeks ago our technique of how we're going to handle all of these type of deployments in the future. And then failures, how are the failures handled? You're always going to have failures when you're in deploying software on people's machines through SCCM or whatever deployment software you use. How do you handle them? I've got a technique that I use now that has been pretty effective and finally at the last moment I just have to call the user and say, hey, I need to gain your machine. Let's find out what's wrong. And then monitoring. How will the deployment be monitored? I usually give our business owner the link to the SCCM webpage and say, here, you can watch and see how the deployment's going, how many successes, how many failures, what offices I've deployed to, and so forth. We usually give that same information to the help desk so that they can actually monitor too. Testing, testing's uh, one of your real important ones, of course. Uh, what steps take place in uh, testing the package before it's pushed out. And then the training materials. Uh, that's the thing about being an SCCM admin. you got to wear a hat in quite a few different avenues of software because when you push that software out, people are going to call you. They're going to say, what's wrong with my software? And I know about the basics on CAD software now, but I'm still really rusty and I'll have to send them off to our help desk that actually have CAD people that know what's going on. <clears throat> so the first thing is, the after the business owners, your stakeholders. Your stakeholders are your developers, people that actually have a vested interest in the deployment. And you gotta get with them because, like right now, I'm pushing Microsoft Office 2013 out and I've got developers that have developed software around 2010. If I don't get with them, their software is definitely going to 
fail the moment I push 13 out. Because uh, we've got some software that was written around Microsoft Access 2010, which is, come to find out, not even compatible with 13. So they're having to redo everything and have to put my project on hold until they can complete. You've got to definitely find out who are the stakeholders and resolve the conflicts with them first before you can proceed any with the actual deployment. Uh, you want to verify functionality of their software you, after you've got it set, after you've got the uh, settings done or whatever changes need to be made, deploy it out, and then you got to go to those stakeholders and say, hey, remote into that machine, tell me, is everything okay? So you can sign off on your part before I push the software. The communications, that to me is the biggest part of the whole deployment process. Whether you fail or are successful, if you don't have the right communications with the users, you're screwed. I've had perfectly good deployments before and I've mistakenly thought, oh, this is perfect. Install, no users uh, issues with it full 100% deployment, and I've had people furious at me. And I was like, oh my God, what did I do wrong? And it was all because of user communications. If you're an SCCM admin, you definitely gotta have a social part of you. Because if you don't, and you just do your job, and you don't communicate, you're gonna have mad people, whether it's successful or not. And then after I did start doing my communications, I mean, I had one package that was a disaster. But because I had good communications out there with everyone, no one was mad, they were understanding, it was a mistake that was made, and we corrected it and it was no problem. And that was all because I had good communications with the users. That's why I highly stress this as the most important part of the whole thing deployment process because you got to have a, a good rapport with your end users for them to understand because if, if you don't you know they expect for everything you do to be perfect which I know everybody here knows that being in IT and I've just I had to learn the hard way <coughs> the communications part so on the communications on the business owners you want to continue with the updates throughout the project communicating with that person, because he or she is the person that's giving you the resources to do this. And they're the ones that are signing off on the whole project. Your stakeholders, of course, my own personal way I do it, I update them only after they've signed off, only if issues arise. At that point, there, there's really no reason to continue keeping them in, in the loop after they've signed off. The information technology part, that's an important one too, the help desk. I'll always keep my help desk in the loop on when I'm deploying stuff because it's easy for, them, for users to start opening tickets left and right and then the help desk is just clobbered with it. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what the software is. I didn't know that you were deploying this. So they're definitely one of your key figures in the IT that you want to keep in the loop when deploying. Uh, keep the build team up to date because usually most of your deployments, your build team's going to have to have the software to include in the build. Uh, inform your colleagues, any other pertinent staff. Uh, I always keep all of, uh, the managers of IT where I work. I always keep all them in the loop. I try to keep mainly. AAs, administrative assistants, I try to keep them in the loop on later phase of the project because I use AAs as my testing bed. They're perfect. Administrative assistants will give you the resources to help other people out in the field when you deploy. They, they, they were a lifesaver for me with Office 2010. In that project, I bought uh, 50 licenses of the $10 company upgrades to Microsoft Office, gave it to all of our AAs, told them, said, hey, use this for a month, here's a copy for your home, and it worked out perfect. They, they 
kept all of our clients in the loop when I employed Office 2010, and it it went very smoothly. So definitely keep the staff informed of all this, especially you know get a get a rapport going with like administrative assistants, people that the people in your firm are going to go to for help. Uh, and of course, report to your manager. Keep them all in the loop on this. The clientele. That's what I've been in, getting on here for a while. Prepare your key clients like your administrative assistants on piloting the software. Because they, they are a huge asset and resource to you. So definitely take advantage of them or any other type of person we've also got we have in our offices um, a technology coordinator in each one of our remote offices that we do and that's what I also leverage their resources on these deployments um, alert all your pertinent clients the upcoming deployment definitely I put out what's called we have what's called a 411 which is a mass communications email sent out to the whole firm when I'm getting ready to Push it up a huge deployment like I'm doing now. Office. So they see that in their inbox and they're oh no! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like like we really have many of them that read it, of course. There you go. But hey, it covers my back end. And that's the whole thing, is keeping yourself covered when you're doing these kind of deployments. I mean, you're going to get a lot of them that are just, you know, they ignore your emails. And I have that still. I mean, I, I just pushed a huge deployment out here last week there was probably 50% that didn't even pay attention and didn't manually insult themselves and ended up, you know, there, there were a few of them mad. And we were like, we told you so. You know, I at least covered my back end. Uh, created, I always create a deployment schedule and I publish it on SharePoint. I go through our list. I work for a company that was about 700 employees there that I deployed to. And before I actually do the deployment, I've already learned that all the users firm wide that, hey, this deployment's coming. And then I go into SharePoint, create a calendar, and I put each one of those users what date they're going to get the push on their machines, and then we send them an email. That's one reason why, we, uh, which I love SCCM, you can just copy right out of a uh, deployment collection. You can copy all those when you're deploying to users, usernames. Paste them right in an email and it automatically recognizes them, and bam. You know, those users know that there's a, a push coming to them. And we're still on communications. That's how important I really think communications is. Uh, communicate the deployment to the end user the night before, which is what I was just saying, is what I do. That's when I send them the email, they've got the uh, notice, hey, it's coming out tonight. Follow up with users. I pick a random number of people, and I'll just call them up and say, "Hey, software get installed on your machine." Because, as you all know, sometimes SCCM can go. It has three ways of going in and checking, see if the software has been deployed. You can do it by registry key. You can do it by the MSI uh, good or by file. Well, as we all know. Though it could write a registry key and still the software could be all messed up on the machine. So I'll pick usually about 10% of the people I'm pushing to and send them emails and then about 2% you know, I'll call them up directly and say, hey, is your software okay? That way I've got a, a good, I know that whether or not the software is probably being good on, on its deployment. Uh, follow up with the business owners, follow up with the stakeholders. Let them all know at that point that, hey, the software's out there, it's done, or we've run into errors. You know, again, the communications with them is, is pertinent. It's, it's the most important part, in my opinion. Prep, prepping for the deployment. I mean, you gotta know your hardware requirements, uh, software requirements, your uh, user requirements, what training, Usually for training for me is I'll usually create a website within SharePoint, download a whole bunch of resources, videos, books, ebooks, and put it out there for the users. I mean, I'm not a, that's
that, that's the only problem we run into being an SEC admin. And like I said earlier, people think that you know your software that you push. And you, all you know is how to push it. You don't know, I'm not a CAD tech, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not gonna know how to, why so-and-so doesn't show up in a design and so forth. So the, the training is definitely important. That's why you need to definitely get with your help desk that knows this kind of stuff. And then the documentation goes right along with that. So it's really, being an SCCM admin, it's, it's more project management than anything. You got your technical side, but it's a huge project management task. And I, at first, I thought, when I started doing this, I was like, why waste all this time doing all this stupid project management stuff? And then I learned how really important it is just to have a satisfied clientele out there of what I was doing. Uh, packaging, the tools that I use, uh, scripting, SMS installer, <laughs> MSI, Packager, Orca. Uh, I mainly use PowerShell, like I said earlier. Uh, SMS installer, if it's a simple package, like I'm just dropping a DLL into it, heck, I'll use SMS installer and it easily drops it in. And it only takes like less than a minute to make the executable. Uh, MSI Packager, we don't have MSI Packagers. They're very expensive. Uh, most MSI Packagers are a thousand plus a year uh, for license costs. And that's why they're like, um, no, on that. They don't think that it's probably worth me paying for a MSI installer for me at that kind of rate, which I kind of see why too. And then Orca, Orca is, um, lets you go in and actually edit the MSI files, create your MST files. And, but I use the PowerShell mainly, and the reason I use PowerShell for scripting my installs, it's robust, very powerful, gives you lots of options, lots of checking. And I've actually uh, designed a standardized installer for deploying software. And I've actually got it out on my blogs that you can download. And it's, it goes through, it authenticates that the software was actually installed, has uninstaller built into it, so you can actually use it as an installer or uninstaller, just by the uh, arguments that you put in a command line with it. it it's real easy to uh, put in there. You don't have to do all the MSI parameters anymore. I've got it where it actually goes in and queries the system and um, finds the GUID, and then it can uh, do the command line by MSI exec and putting the GUID in there instead of having to actually look up in the registry key for uh, creating an uninstaller. And then SCCM, that's the other part. You can actually use, unlike the old SMS, you can actually use SCCM to manage the entire deployment without having to use a script. The reason I don't use that and I use a script is because there are three avenues of installing software that I want to cover when I write the script. I want the script to be able to work, number one, when it's deployed through SCCM. I want it to work if the user double clicks on the PowerShell script. I want it to be able to work from that and I want it to be able to work from MDT when a system is being built. So basically I want the installer to work in all three of those avenues and SCCM could actually handle it because you can put like an executable in one uh, part of the package. You can create another one for let's say a register key change, but that doesn't give you the option if you need to you know, do a command line. Uh, let's say it breaks on a person's system, the help desk gets a ticket, and they need to reinstall the software. You know, at least they've got the PowerShell script there. They can right click on it and bam, it reinstalls it. I've learned with help desk in the past, that's where I actually got my automation specialization, was uh, sometimes they don't do everything they should do, and so that's when I started getting my specialization into automation to automate all this stuff and be able to make it easy to deploy software. Deployments. Uh, we deploy through uh, SCCM, there's, there's also SMS, which is the old one, uh, 
case. Verification, like I said, verification is definitely one of the important parts. Compliance. You definitely got to make sure you know that all your clients are complying with you, because with the laptops that we deploy to, you, the lid is closed. It doesn't reboot. That's why we have user interaction with ours, and that's actually where we have gone to. We don't do the automated installs anymore because of this, the laptop community that we have. So the way we deploy is, we'll deploy software. We give them. Uh, usually a week in advance, and we advertise it to their software center in SCCM, and we bombard them with emails, alerts, say, hey, it's there, install it at your own leisure, but if you don't install it, by this date, it gets mandatory installed. That way, it works with the user, they're informed, and it's really worked well for us. Um, my deployment, the, the level of success went up drastically by taking this approach. And we went from probably 10% laptops three years ago. We're now 80% laptops. And we plan on going 100% here by the end of next year. So it's definitely a much more challenging area to, to push software in. The troubleshooting, troubleshooting systems for the, the deployments failing, the approach I use for that is SMF, SCCM will rerun on a system when it's failed. I can't tell you right off the frequency that it will rerun, but after a day that it continues to fail, I use PS Exec. And I grab the whole list of machines that are failing, run PS Exec and then the command line for the script installer against their machines, and then all those the systems that don't fail on that, um, they're successful. Remove those from the list, but the ones that still don't install, those are my last ones I've just got to call. That there's there's nothing no way around that at that point, but I think PS Exec is a great tool for being able to to lower that list of failures from the SCCM deployment. And you know there's a whole there's always a whole list. 1603 <coughs> is my most common error that I see, especially with Microsoft deployments, and it always comes down to they have something running in the background that's killing the deployment, and I just have to you know, go in there and find out myself. Usually, the number of people that I have to do out of 700 is usually 5 to 10 max, so it's not a huge number of failures there. And so, that's where we, we have got a new list here that I'm going to show you all. And that's a list that um, that I made here of how we determine how the software is going to be deployed to users. Um, the flowchart was the best option we could come up with, and this comes in the first part when I'm talking to the business owner of the software. And so we have to tell whether the software is like a mandatory. Does the user have to have it, or is it an optional? Can they just, you know, whether they want it or not? Um, then is it a crucial deployment? That's the second question that we have for them. And then is um, is there going to be an application closure? Does meaning does it have to forcefully close an app for the installation to go through? And finally, is there a system reboot? And then that's what gives us goes through this chart here and determines how we deploy the software. So the three scenarios for deploying the software is number one. The user has no interaction at all, and that's usually like a hot fix. Something doesn't require a reboot, no user interaction, it's all behind the scenes. Uh, number two, user, like I said like earlier, the user has, um, let's say, a week to install it themselves, and then it becomes mandatory at that point. And then the third one, which is on the second page, the third one is the completely optional route. That's where the software's there, it's in the software center. Do they want it? It's all up to them. It's never forced on And this is what's really transformed my job. 
company's relations with uh, end users there and given us a much better rapport with them and kind of cleared up some old wounds that had been created in the past with them. And it, it's a, a method that I highly recommend. And if any of you all want this, if you're SECM admins and you're interested, I have it out there on my blogs that you can um, go out there and download. And the same thing with the scripts. I have all those PowerShell scripts that I've written for the uninstallers, the installer packages. They're out there on my blogs also. Any questions? Well, we have an uh, enterprise agreement with Microsoft, and it's included in our agreement. Um, SCCM is, and we're actually going also with SCSM right now, and it, it integrates, that's our ticketing, software ticketing system too, and it all integrates the asset um, tracking uh, in the firm. Like, when it goes out, and SCCM will go out and do a, a hardware inventory on all the machines, give you a list of like hardware, software, and so forth. And then that can integrate with our SCSM for the help desk, so they get an uh, up-to-date uh, list of who has what in the firm. Um, hey, Matt, do we tell them about SCOM? Just about to ask them that, seriously. You can go ahead and Skip SCOM. Forget it. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> Forget it. We had 2005. SCOM, I know. Forget it. I know. We I, have, I have one word for you. Nagios. Yeah, that's what... Yeah, we finally went back to that. I heard that. <laughs> Screw ESCOM. It's, it's that bad? Worse. Really? Worse. Go back to Nagios. That's good to know. We actually use uh, Spiceworks inventory. Yes, yeah, that's a good tool. Mm -hmm. What all the software's on. But Nagios is more monitoring than it is inventory. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to think there is a... Um, it's a freeware program out there that's available. Well, it's not freeware when it comes to the enterprise environment. I'm trying to think of the name of it. And I've used it a lot. Um, and it get, it's an awesome piece of software. Well, the question we want to ask is, mm -hmm. how, how controlling is your software deployment regarding uh, available freeware applications. Oh, um, are you op an open shop, or are you very closed in how you and what you allow your users to use? Well, that's that's a good question because we have been a very closed shop until the last uh, ditch with Adobe. <laughs> oh. We're very unhappy with Adobe now, and we everybody a, is, including Apple and Microsoft. Yes, especially now the uh, CC that. Uh, after uh, CS6, that we'll have to pay for that $800 a year per license. So we are. We're using uh, Scribus for one. Um, some of the others. <laughs> I believe I have them right here. Well, actually, I'm not VPN in our network, okay. but. I was going to say, I was going to look, pull up a software center, but we, we are using Scribus. Um, I think we're uh, a GIMP, GIMP shop. We're using GIMP shop, and it, it's very, very close to uh, Photoshop. It's very slick. Uh, you know what? Well, I Photoshop just, elements. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be unfair with you. I, I happen to be the president of the National Linux Users Group. Okay, and I'm going to sit here and tell you that the GIMP is not Photoshop. No, there are the, there are the portions of it, but for what a lot of our users need, yeah, it's yeah, we're we're pushing definitely. Open. Oh, I, I use it. Don't get me wrong. Oh, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> but it ain't Photoshop. Inkscape. Yes, Inkscape is another one. You're right. I've That's the other that one we're pushing too, and we're making it available to more and more of our users that that want to use those in place of these because. Sure. Um, well, my question has to do with uh, it, it's not exactly on it's not exactly on subject uh, mm -hmm. other than uh, the open subject that we just mentioned there. What about um, 
like, so if you were to create your own uh, OS out of like from uh, uh, B BSM or mm -hmm. something like that, um, how, what? How, how do you feel about that in general? And could you maybe talk about like if you were to deploy an OS? Sure. Um, we're actually deploying uh, the little flash drive OSs right now. We're just te we're testing it out actually. We're, we're building a few of those. I like them, but the problem with those is, you know, software availability. Um, we we're locked into a lot of enterprise agreements, um, such as Adobe, for instance. Um, we're locked in with Autodesk, and you know they don't have any support for those platforms. Um, we would love, don't get me wrong, we'd love to. In fact, the last director we had, he wanted to possibly explore going in uh, that route. Uh, we're, my wife works out at MDON, and she's a project manager out there. And MDON uses lots of Linux. Most of their stuff is. And, and that's why they went that route. So you're saying that like, uh, and I, my, my example would be like a college. If a college wanted to create its own OS for all of its machines, mm -hmm. you're saying that um, it's not guaranteed that the, the major commercial entities are going to be able or would even have any sort of uh, terms of use with that whole OS. Is that what you're saying? That's a good question. I, I'm not, I have not 100% sure, but I would say not. It's going to be risky. Yeah, I would say with companies such as Adobe, which is so strict on their um, EULA. What, what is their problem? They, it's, they're horrible. <laughs> I don't get it. I, I, mean, I mean, I'm going to say they are the worst company I've ever dealt with, Adobe is. Um, I mean, they have, they have changed their licensing on us so many times. I mean, I, I just uh, did that project six months ago and upgraded all of us from CS3 to CS6. And, of course, that's the last project will I'll ever be able to do uh, with that many uh, di additions apart now it's you know you got you, it incrementally yes wow. or you lose your licensing <coughs> and uh, that was only for an incremental time and then they came up with CC and now you've got to get the agreement which we're going to do next year uh, we want to get some at least some use we spent fifty three thousand dollars on this last upgrade with Adobe and we're facing hundred thousand dollars a year now. That's we were losses. paying we were paying fifty three thousand every oh, well, three okay. years. You're doing you're doing more than Adobe Reader and and, and, and Flash. So yeah. oh yeah, we go the full suites and oh, I got that part because we got graphics designers and yeah. such. But yeah, I mean we go from fifty three thousand every three to more than ninety thousand every year now. Wow, we're not happy. It's like cut your losses, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, so we're we're up a creek right now with them, and it's like we say is what happens if there's another 2008 incident? And the economy, I mean, my firm downsized 40 yeah. percent in 2008, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. and what happens in that? And you know, we're having to pay 90 some thousand dollars a year that we just couldn't afford then. So we're definitely trying to go the open source route on more and more of our software. We just did the open source on project. Um, we're, we're going that. No, we still need it for our um, official project managers, but for others, that, like assistants that help our project managers, we're using uh, open proj for them. And that's worked out really well. Because we're looking at $600 a license for Microsoft Project. You think Adobe knew that you, they had firms like yours in the pinch? I mean, you think they knew that like we can go forward with this because we got the contracts? Oh, I, I, I'm pretty sure they did. I mean, yeah. you know, that sounds so dirty. It, it really is. Yeah. And I just, and I'm not the only one. I, one of my friends is IT director over at HCA. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me the same thing. He was like, they're having the same issues with Adobe over there. And they're just as mad as we are. And it's just, you know, what do you do? Um, we've got clients out there that use Adobe products. We've got to have them. I mean, we were still sitting at CS3 here until this last year, um, which December was the deadline. You had to upgrade then, or you didn't. You lost your upgradeability. And at that point, you know, we got CS6. What are we going to, you know, because we had so many clients that were saying, "Hey, why aren't you all using the most current?" 
and now with the CC out, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's you know, it, it's going to be a, an interesting situation in the next in the upcoming years, and, and the same thing is probably going to happen not with like us because we have an enterprise agreement with Microsoft, but smaller companies that um, have agreements with uh, or don't have agreements with Microsoft but have Office, and they're going to be forced into. I have two words for you: LibreOffice. Well, yeah. Forget it. Yeah. No, no doubt. I mean, it, they're going to have to. I mean, because you know, some of these smaller firms, like we have a lot of competitors, that are, uh, engineering firms sure. that are single man, uh, just a handful of people, and those kind of firms just can't afford those kind of rates. I mean, they're already paying five thousand dollars a year for a license for Autodesk alone, right? Um, per machine, right? You know, let alone having to you know fork out for Office 360 or you know Office 2013. On a yearly, a yearly or a monthly basis. Um, actually, the new, the new approach we're taking with Adobe is that that I've actually suggested to them is Adobe has the uh, monthly leasing. Well, we have a lot of users there that will uh, will get awarded a project from a client. Uh, like we just got a hospital project in Florida. Well, all of a sudden we've got several engineers that need Adobe for uh, rendering and. So my suggestion is, let's get a license that we buy only for a month. That's what, I, that's what I personally do. Yeah, and that's what we're ex, uh, experimenting with right now. But the big issue is, we're a big enough firm that it's hard to manage all of those. You know, when we get those licenses, because when you do that with Adobe, and you've probably seen this, if you don't watch that, it's a recurring expense. Oh, yeah. It just doesn't end. So you know we could. Buy I got to raise the cash register. That's easy. Oh yeah. It's easy for me to do. It's not easy for you to do for these guys one week, these guys the next week, yes. these guys the other week. But I, I will give Adobe credit. Now, now that's interesting. You said that they have come through with a new package. It's a management pack that they have, and we're going to try to uh, educate our AAs on that, and they can um, redistribute the license to different users. Right. And now that and that was just recent that they came out with that, and that's a huge improvement on their side. Wow! I guess they figured that you know they had made enough people mad already. They paid out a little Vaseline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Thank you. yeah. But I, I mean, most companies that I've dealt with are, are pretty good to deal with, except for Adobe. Yeah, unreal. I mean, I mean, I had a, an issue with them. On the CS6, they had promised, and I had it in writing from their uh, the direct North American director of customer service. She wrote in writing, and uh, that we would get CS6 free of charge. And she n wouldn't answer my calls. Nothing. I know her by I know her by name. I'm not gonna say it, but I know her by name. Sure. And I finally had to go to. I just started calling different ones in California at their office, and I was like, okay, why isn't this woman calling me back? I've got the letter. I scanned it. I emailed it to them. I said, look, she gave us the letter saying we would get CS6 for this number of machines free, and she's not giving us the license. What's going on? And we finally got it five months later. Yeah. So, you know, that that's another thing that... that entails with an SCCM admin is the um, um, dealing with licensing and purchasing all that kind of stuff so it's, it's definitely a um, it's a I'll put it this way being an SCCM admin it's a well-rounded position yeah <laughs> professional spear catcher it is that's right. <laughs> That's right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.